I'm Maggie Ortiz Milan, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, I just want to say a few words about EERI for those who may not be familiar. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting those dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. Through its activities, EERI provides members with the technical knowledge, collaborative networks, leadership and advocacy skills, and multidisciplinary context to achieve earthquake resilience in their communities. By joining EERI, you become a member of our global network of multidisciplinary professionals, and support from members makes events like this webinar possible. This webinar is being presented as part of our Learning from Earthquakes program, or LFE. Through LFE, EERI conducts multidisciplinary reconnaissance and shares lessons from earthquakes around the world. You can learn more about the Learning from Earthquakes program at learningfromearthquakes.org, where there's also information from over 300 earthquakes in 50 countries. During today's webinar, we'll hear from several speakers who will provide preliminary observations from the August 14, 2021 magnitude 7.2 Haiti earthquake. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them using the questions box and make sure to indicate which speaker your question is for. Speakers will be responding to questions throughout the webinar. Um, so next we'll hear from Kate Allstadt about USGS landslide mapping efforts following the earthquake. Kate is a research geophysicist at the USGS Geological Hazard Science Center in Golden, Colorado. Kate's research includes seismically induced landslide and liquefaction hazards and the incorporation of near real-time ground failure models into the USGS earthquake product suite. She also studies seismic methods of detecting, tracking, and characterizing landslide. Good. Okay, great. Um, so as Maggie said, um, my name is Kate Alsta, and I work with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and I'm going to talk about the landslides that were triggered by the NEEP earthquake. Um, and I'm going to focus primarily on the rapid response effort that the USGS undertook. It was myself and six other USGS scientists who are listed on, on this slide as well. Um, so we undertook a rapid response um, satellite imagery analysis and mapping effort to provide situational awareness to teams on the ground, primarily through USAID. Um, so I'm going to talk mainly about remote sensing, um, wh what we know from the satellite imagery, basically, um, because we did not go in the field. And then the following talk, we'll talk about field observations. So this is a summary slide of kind of the timeline of the sequence of events and also the USGS response um, to, to that from the landslide perspective. Um, on the right, we have a summary figure of the earthquake. Um, so you can see the epicenter is at on the eastern end um, and the contours here are showing the USGS shake map um, peak, peak ground acceleration estimates. Um, so you can see that the rupture started in the east and, and ruptured towards the west. The black dots here, those are the landslides that we have currently mapped. And you can see that while the um, landslides occurred in the entire affected area, um, there's a high density of landslides on the western end. Um, and part of that is because of the, the terrain is extremely rugged over here. Um, but also there's likely a component of directivity because the earthquake ruptured towards the west. And so there may have been a directivity pulse that may have increased the landslide intensity. Um, in the background of this map, we're showing the, um, the USGS near real-time landslide model, which I'll talk about briefly, but that's one of kind of the earlier um, components of response that, that we can do for landslides. These are automatic models that run as soon as we have shaking estimates. Um, and so I'll talk about those briefly. Um, <clears throat> so on the left, we have our timeline. The earthquake was on August 14th. Um, and then two days later, it was fo followed by a tropical cyclone. Um, and that could have triggered additional landslides. Uh, we don't have the resolution in the satellite imagery to differentiate what triggered what. But based on what the landslides look like, most of them were probably triggered by the earthquake. Um, <clears throat> so after the earthquake happened, um, we undertook this rapid effort to provide situational awareness. Um, so as satellite imagery came in, this team of seven of us looked at it, mapped things, and if we saw things of concern, we passed those on to people on the ground. And then over the past um, couple of weeks or so, we've kind of slowed down and refined the inventory and focused more on what the long-term hazards are. So things like landslide dams and, and other issues that might need to have um, you know, a more detailed look at this point. Um, and then we're working on making all of this work uh, publicly available through the USGS review process as well. 
Okay, so so back to kind of the beginning <clears throat> um, of the response timeline. So the, <clears throat> the USGS produces these near real time products. We talked about some of them, including the shake map, which provides shaking estimates. Um, there's also pager, which many of you may be familiar with that estimates economic losses and fatalities. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the ground failure product, which I, I already kind of gave you a sneak peek, but this is a relatively new product that um, we put online about two years ago. Um, and it is based on really simple, low resolution models, um, and they're meant just for rapid situational awareness. So as soon as we have USGS shake map, we can run this for any earthquake in the world. And it just provides a quick, um, just like a, a peek at what we might expect, like where the landslides might happen, how intense the landslides or liquefaction might be, and if there's a lot of people in the area. Um, so here I'm showing the landslide model and the liquefaction model. Um, I won't be talking about liquefaction much, but the next talk we'll talk about that. I'll focus on landslides here. Um, and you can see that in the summary card, the alert levels are elevated because there's significant population exposed to both of these hazards. Um, another product that we haven't put online yet, but we can run internally, <clears throat> takes that model <clears throat> excuse me, and estimates uh, where roads might have been blocked. Um, and so we ran this product for, for this event and it identified some areas. And this area in particular, this is the main road, uh, Route Nacional 7, goes from Lake Kai to Jeremy and connects to a lot of the remote communities. So this actually was severely blocked. We didn't have imagery of it until quite a bit later. This is what that section looks like. Um, just a series of really um, pretty significant landslides. Here's a screenshot from some drone imagery of that site. It took a while for them to clear that, and that was a big issue for getting, um, you know, supplies to, to people, especially in remote areas. Um, okay, so once we started to get imagery coming in, it was, you know, a wide variety of resolutions and quality and cloud coverage, um, but we just did the best we could. Seven of us mapped uh, at the same time using the ArcGIS Pro and online suite where you can all be mapping independently and the points actually all get updated in real time. And we shared that with the public and with the, um, with the USAID disaster assistance response teams um, in, in real time. And so we mapped about 3,600 landslides during this phase. Um, and one area that was of early concern is this Peak Micaiah National Park, which I've circled here. Um, so it's pretty remote, nobody lives there, um, but it was very severely affected. This is a before image from Sentinel-2, and this is an after image of the landslides. Um, so it was really intense landsliding, and a big concern early on is that the landslides might start uh, impounding water behind them, and then the landslide dams could fail catastrophically. And the problem with that is that there's um, Lake Kai, the, you know, one of the largest cities in the affected area is downstream from this, as well as some smaller settlements. There also were citizen reports that there was a dam forming and a lake forming. Um, and so this was a, a big concern early on. Um, so USAID was able to arrange for an overflight um, and uh, Haitian scientist Nuda Scaro Saint Fleur was able to uh, to take some photos to kind of get an understanding of what was going on. And the photos at the left are from that Peak Micaiah Gorge, so you can see just how intense the landsliding was in that area. Um, it turned out there was a landslide dam, um, but it had most water had mostly found its way through by the 19th. There was still some ponding then, but it had kind of found its way through. This image is from uh, August 27th, and you can see the water's getting through just fine now. Um, and so there's no landslide dams um, currently in Peak Micaiah, fortunately, but there are some in other places, which I'll talk about. Um, as far as direct impacts, there undoubtedly were quite a few. Um, there's a lot of news reports on it. Um, there definitely were fatalities. There were people who lost their homes and their farms and their animals. Um, this is the human impacts we can't really assess with satellite imagery very well. There were some areas like this one on the right. When we had really high resolution imagery, you could see where landslides potentially had uh, impacted homes. Um, but, but we don't know a lot from the imagery itself about how people were affected. This is kind of a proxy for it. This shows the landslide map and the landslides highlighted in red have um, estimated population of more than 50 people within 200 meters of the landslide. And that's using a pretty high resolution population data set from Columbia University. Um, and so you can see, even though that 
landslide was really intense in the west, there likely were a lot of human impacts in the east as well. Okay, so after we kind of finished this rapid response phase of the project, we then kind of went back and, you know, more imagery was coming in and we went back and re-reviewed a lot of the areas looking for more long-term hazards that might need, um, you know, people to kind of keep an eye on. And so this map here shows the, summarizes the result of that analysis. Um, so you can see the yellow dots, those are all landslide dams that either partially or completely are obstructing a channel. Um, many of those are minor, they look like small landslides that water is gonna find its way through. Um, but we flagged in red, a lot of landslides that might be of concern going forward. Uh, about 20 of them had pooling water behind them. Uh, a lot of them are very large. Um, but are blocking a channel that does not currently have water in it. So we don't really know how they're going to respond, you know, when there is water in the channel. Uh, we also flagged road hazards. Um, many of the roads have been cleared by now, but there's some areas where you, you can see that there's still a lot of um, destabilized material above the road and there likely will be con continue to be material coming down, causing issues with those roads. Um, here's a oblique view of one of the landslide dams. You can see the, the pond here. Um, it's unclear if any water is getting through at this location. Um, here's another one shown in uh, false color imagery. This one's close to a road. It has a, you know, a pond that's you know, maybe 200 meters long. Um, so there are hundreds of these and 20 of them have, have ponding. Um, and the issue with, with that is that they could catastrophically fail. And even if there's nobody like immediately downstream, you know, it can, these flood surges can travel um, to more populated areas. Um, another issue that's, that's going to present itself for at least several years is the landslides have deposited a ton of debris in channels all over the place. Um, and so from past earthquakes, we've seen that um, the debris flow activity usually is quite a bit higher than from before the earthquake for about up to five years or so um, until things kind of restabilize. Um, and then another issue is that the addition of all this sediment to the channels is going to kind of change the behavior of the rivers. It's probably going to change the flooding behavior, it decreases the capacity of the rivers to carry water downstream. So there could be long-term changes to the flooding patterns in a lot of areas. Um, and this figure here is a very simple analysis we did where we took all the river layers and just computed how many landslides per kilometer were within a couple hundred meters of each channel. Um, and so you can see the the channels that are probably going to be affected by debris flows and flooding changes and so on. You know, we have the Peak Makaya Gorge, of course, but there's actually quite a few other channels um, in these more populated areas that might be of concern moving forward. And then I'll just end with a quick comparison with the 2010 earthquake, which also triggered a lot of landslides. It's not exactly a fair comparison because we have a research grade inventory of the 2010 earthquake that was published six years after the earthquake that's shown in red on the right. Um, so it's undoubtedly way more complete than the rapid inventory that we've mapped so far. But, but interestingly, um, even though it, it does look like the area affected by landslides is quite a bit broader for the 2010 earthquake, um, the number of landslides that are of significant size, so in this case, a thousand square meters um, for the 2010 earthquake is about the same as the number that we've already mapped. And we, we weren't mapping things much smaller than a thousand meters squared at this point. Um, so the total number may end up being somewhat similar um, in the end. So so with that, I'll, I'll finish and pass it on to, to Shade to tell us about what they're seeing on the ground and so on. Thanks, Kate. We actually do have one question and we have a couple minutes for it. Um, mm -hmm. This is from Keith Adams. Is the concentration of landslides in the mountains to the west of the epicenter of the main shock due to directivity or do you think the significant after uh, aftershocks may be responsible? Um, probably a little bit of both, but we do have that image that I showed um, from Sentinel-2 is from the the 14th, you know, the day of the earthquake. Um, so a lot of the intense landslides were triggered during the earthquake. Um, I'm sure that more material came down in aftershocks, but we know a lot of those were there right after the earthquake. Um, so I think directivity and also just the ruggedness of the terrain um, is, is a big part of, of why that 
that area was so intensely impacted. Great, thank you, Kate. And just a reminder, if anybody has additional questions for Kate, you can type them into the questions box. Uh, next, we'll hear from Shade Dashti about geotechnical engineering observations from this earthquake. Shade is an associate professor in geotechnical engineering and geomechanics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She obtained her undergraduate degree at Cornell University and graduate degrees at the University of California, Berkeley. Shade is currently a co-chair of the Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Group. Shade. Okay, thank you, Maggie and ERI. I'll be presenting together with, um, oh my, this is, I'll be presenting together with uh, Joanne Pagodin um, on behalf of uh, GEAR. I'll be uh, first going over the geotechnical lessons from this earthquake, that is part one of our presentation, and later. Uh, Joanne will discuss the social political aspects of this earthquake in part two, which we explored collaboratively uh, in our team. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the GEAR team whose work and data I'll be presenting. Uh, our team consisted of geotechnical engineers, engineering seismologists, geologists uh, from University of Colorado Boulder, North Carolina State, uh, University, University of Michigan, Arab in San Francisco and New York, and AECOM. Uh, we also had a group of social scientists from Florida International University, USC and University of Southern Florida. To collect data uh, on the ground. Um, because of the um, nature of this is, it seems like my slides are moving slow. Okay, there we go. Uh, because of the nature of this event and lack of immediate physical presence due to safety and security concerns, we relied on a large variety of sources to collect information as quickly as we could. Um, with existing reports from different sources, satellite imagery, drone data, um, ground motion recordings from different sources, photographs and videos on social media, and uh, mainstream media, and finally, traditional field reconnaissance with our local collaborating engineers. Um, and lastly, we benefited greatly from collaboration and coordination with STEER, who made their phone app available to us and regularly sent us geotechnically relevant observations as regular communication with Geohazards International and their um, engineers in Haiti. So uh, the preliminary results and insight that I'll be presenting today necessarily comes from a large variety of sources, which leads to variations in quality and uh, resolution of um, information. As a, a brief background on tectonics, Haiti is located in the western part of the island of um, Hispaniola, as uh, my USGS colleagues mentioned earlier, the region is geologically and tectonically young and therefore quite dynamic and uh, unstable. Um, the, the different plates in the region characterizes complex and diverse tectonic regimes. And, and this figure shows a summary of the tectonics in the region essentially. And similar to the 2010 seismic event, the fault mechanism uh, for the 2021 NIP earthquake indicates oblique faulting according to the USGS. Oblique faults result from a combination of shearing and tension or compressional forces, which as mentioned by Sue earlier, um, means that they will have some component of dip slip in normal or reverse and some component. I'll be uh, showing evidence of surface fault rupture and possibly normal fault movements later um, in, in, in my presentation. Now, focusing on ground motions, these maps show the locations and status of seismographs and strong motion stations uh, that are currently installed in Haiti, which Sue also referenced earlier. Um, unfortunately, only two of these stations within Haiti pass the signal processing quality checks. Um, the closer station at 25 kilometers uh, of the epicenter is a low cost raspberry shake sensor. And um, the further station at 130 kilometers is a strong motion net quake instrument. Um, here I'm showing the two horizontal components of both records in terms of acceleration time histories and the response spectra of all three components from these two stations. Um, these records essentially indicate a PGA of up to about 
0.25 and 0.4 G in the horizontal direction and 0.25 G in the vertical direction at the station that was closer to the epicenter. Um, from preliminary pulse, the closer station is indicating possi possible um, directivity effects in the north-south direction. And um, here I'm showing the Fourier amplitude spectra of the two horizontal components at the station. The closer left figure indicating activation of the north-south component lower frequencies, which could be attributed um, directivity. Um, this past weekend, we were able to send a team of five students from University of Haiti to a few locations and routes that we had previously identified as sites of interest based on satellite imagery, USGS hazard maps, social media, and other sources. This is one of the paths from Lakai up north and another path going um, east from Lakai and then looping around. Uh, some of the preliminary findings in terms of geotechnical hazards together with uh, what we had collected previously from uh, other sources. Here are a few examples of foundation failure in the southern part of Haiti, which we identified through social media during reconnaissance planning. Um, we also uh, monitored the data collected by STEER members and identified locations of possible ejecta and liquefaction, which affected the performance of um, some of these buildings. Um, our collaborator, um, Dr. Kelly Guyer, um, in, performed an SBT-based liquefaction analysis. Um, the factor of safety presented in the plot to the right um, is based on an estimated PGA of about 0.35 G. Both factor of safety and LPI values indicate potential for liquefaction and moderate to major um, damage due to ground failure in uh, south of Lake Kai. Um, in addition to these areas on the south, our gear team also identified possible evidence of foundation damage due to liquefaction in the north near Pastel. And um, now in terms of lateral spread during uh, reconnaissance planning, we used social media to find evidence of lateral ground movements that could indicate lateral spread due to liquefaction or possibly um, cyclic softening as you see in, in um, this video here. And uh, um, uh, these movements um, affected the uh, performance of the buildings and um, other entities. Um, also, we used satellite imagery, which was uncertain as the time, timing was not uh, uh, precise. Evidence of possible lateral spread on the left from satellite and some of uh, these uh, points that we had identified um, were later confirmed by our gear team. Um, again, lateral spread observations by gear in regions near the epicenter that affected structures as well as pipelines in the south as well as northern areas, um, as you see on the top map. Our team also found evidence of damage to what appears as loosely constructed retaining structures in a number of areas affecting the performance of buildings and highways, um, and therefore connectivity of roads and um, emergency response. Now to identify areas of potential landslide, and some of what I'll be presenting will overlap with Kate's presentation before me, uh, we first explored satellite imagery prior to the earthquake um, and then after the earthquake, indicating landslide activity due to earthquake and possibly storm combined. But note how cloud cover limited the vision here. Um, if we focus on the area specifically in the red box, this image is prior to the earthquake and then post earthquake, keep going back and forth before and after. Um, despite the cloud cover, we can see notable evidence of landslide. Um, there were also many reports of uh, landslide on social media that we made use of during reconnaissance planning. Um, and that led to finally uh, pictures of landslide collected by the gear team on the ground in different regions in proximity to the fault here closer to the epicenter in Neep. This is by our own team. 
and by uh, Geohazard International Engineers closer to the epicenter. And um, again, further north. Uh, multiple other areas were indicated as so surface fault rupture by the gear team, but some of the images appeared to be um, more related to slope failure or were too far away from the fault to be attributed to surface rupture. Um, the region that's indicated with the pin on the right is possibly surface fault rupture, but um, we need further investigation to confirm this. Um, and here the image to the left indicates a downthrown block, which is consistent with historical observations of normal fault rupture. Uh, but this is, these are some uh, trends that we are um, investigating now. And finally, we are now overlaying some of the observations of landslide on the USGS uh, landslide hazard map that Kate mentioned to better understand their uh, distribution causes and distinctions um, between landslide and surface rupture. And uh, in the end, I will um, mention very briefly that in our interdisciplinary gear team, we are exploring the intersection of different crises in Haiti since 2010 and their social political effects with some of the geotechnical and seismological variables that we routinely investigate as geotechnical engineers. Joanne will get into more details here, um, but um, I will mention as an example, uh, here is a map showing the population density in grayscale, the area with the lowest average annual income, overlaid on shaking intensity contours and the liquefaction hazard with this colored scale. Um, we see that the highest population density, lowest income level, and highest risk of soil liquefaction in this case seems to overlap, potentially worsening the exposure of the most vulnerable population um, to this hazard. I will stop here and our gear member, Joanne, will continue on social political observations um, toward the end of this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shade. Next, we'll hear from Jeff de Devilme about building uh, damage observations made in the days following the earthquake. Jephthah is a field officer for Geohazards International in Haiti. He is a lawyer, a professor of social science, and an active volunteer with Haiti's Department of Civil Protection. He has a BS in Development Sciences and a law degree. For GHI, Deville <laughs> coordinates earthquake preparedness activities in schools, churches, and door-to-door -door campaigns. Jephthah. And Jeff has pre-recorded his presentation, so we'll get that going now. Invitation. And thank you, Maggie. And I take this opportunity to, to thank URI for this invitation. And I say hi to all the speakers. I, it's a pleasure for me to, to be one of the speakers today. And my name is Chef Tadevin May. I, I live in Savo. Uh, I work for GHI High Field Officer. So on Savo is a community close to the epicenter of the last earthquake. So during my presentation I will I will talk about the uh, building the match and how we are affected by the last earthquake. So three departments have been uh, affected by the earthquake and NIP, uh, SOL and Grados. And according to the Directorate of Civil Protection, there was about more than um, uh, 50,000 50, and building that were affected by this. Uh, uh, 15,000 buildings have been collapsed uh, during the last earthquake. So you can see in the map of the, the city and the three departments, Ten Nip, Sud, and Gradas, and, and also uh, where the epicenter was. And the, the next slide shows uh, uh, 
the number of aftershock hit the, the street department because uh, we collaborate with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with Eric Calais and a project so and some uh, local seismometer raspberry star and area and we could see uh, the, the aftershock the aftershock just after it happened and so this map shows uh, the number of aftershock more than more than than more than than one thousand aftershock and uh, so just after the earthquake one day later uh, I went to the field in order to make some observation and take some pictures and I I want to put it with it and also I went to uh, Petit Rivière and, and two days after I went to Lazil where we see the, uh, the so one of one of the most affected or I can say that I can say the most affected city in NIP and NIP the most affected city is Lazil but for for Sud for example uh, it's Capire and for Goras at Pestel. So during this presentation, I will show you some pictures of uh, of building that have been severely uh, damaged or are called, have been collapsed. So schools, churches, and health facilities and house, all those buildings have been affected by by the earthquake. So as you can see on this uh, slide, and uh, the schools and and Lazil and Sanai and national and Pumari national schools and Sanai. So there is uh, uh, it's very very really affected. So it it's very really difficult uh, to retrofit it. And the next uh, the next photo show uh, in other in other schools and Nazil also, but not yet on the center. And so this, this slide showed a, 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 a Pumari school and put it good in it and name uh, uh, Betel. So a part of, uh, of the building have been collapsed. And also we, we go to Change. Change is a locality in Nazil. It's the a most affected locality uh, in NIP. So uh, more than on 98 percent uh, building in this locality have, uh, have been destroyed or have severe damage. So there's there's pictures. There's two pictures show uh, the two two schools and uh, and change. So completely destroyed. And uh, as I said, I went to to put it in it. This slide show the uh, the primary uh, a primary school and uh, and put it in it, and also the uh, the the high school, the lycée of put it in it. So we can see there is a part uh, completely destroyed, but all the parts are uh, have uh, a severe damage. Schools is not only one the building affected by the earthquake. So in Lazil, uh, this uh, photo shows the maternity of Lazil. The maternity of Lazil has been in, in completely destroyed, as you can see in this in this photo. And also we move on to we 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 go back to to change in order to see uh, the the damage and 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 churches so there's photos show two churches we have uh, uh, several damage as always and concrete a uh, building where with concrete block with block uh, I was vernacular, timber, and masonry. All the all building 
our houses have been affected by by the earthquake. So you can see that and this uh, and these slides so or some uh, vernacular vernacular chamber and masonry and house and and Ansaro and locality Bosa so has been affected by the quake and and partially uh, destroyed. So I take uh, there is two photos one and pretty two in it the other one and 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 pretty two here in it. So uh, I, I was with uh, building with uh, with uh, a concrete block with block but uh, also always aff also affected by by the earthquake. Uh, this photo is a semi confined uh, confined uh, concrete block masonry and ensemble as you can see in this picture. So a part of this building has been uh, severely affected. So my observation that I I see uh, most of the building uh, uh, severely the major have been collapsed. Uh, have been built before before. 2010 earthquake before 2010 though so during these days no not yet uh, any uh, any construction code available and so now we had a, a national code of construction but uh, and before these we 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 had it and so most of the building affected building uh, built before 20, 2010 for example, for the public building before 2010, and they, as I said, there is no code for of construction for the house, uh, and no uh, uh, engineering, and so for the for the for example for the vernacular uh, non-engineering and construction lacks earthquake resistant feature. So also, or uh, people use poor quality uh, materials such as a weak, weak block, so the block, the blocks uh, are not good for the construction, so uh, that's one of the main cause of, uh, of, of collapse and severe damage of building. And other, other cause that uh, also that the, and people build and wherever, wherever, so, uh, not yet taken consideration. The, it's, this area is safe for landslides or other things. So people build wherever. But uh, what we what we did our action. She was international just after the the, the earthquake. So we uh, we develop a, a partnership with uh, Steel and we go to the field in order to to collect data. Uh, we we and the first time we collect data uh, uh, on the public building schools uh, churches and uh, at facilities and uh, government and but after we uh, with a fund uh, a USAID fund so we, 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 we go to uh, so we we extend this activity to house so, uh, that's why I think Tracy will will talk m more about about this. And as the population was very uh, panicked after the after the earthquake, so uh, and there was uh, many many aftershock. So we 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 conduct uh, our church activity, our church activity, and uh, and it have most affected the city and NIP uh, in order to to let people know uh, the best behavior during the aftershocks. And also what to do in general uh, before, during, and after an earthquake. And so, uh, what we can say that uh, let we say to the to people, let we will be the done before. That's what you can see in the last uh, slide. So uh, it's cool. Another a uh, a house. So we promote that let we will be the than before so thank you so much thank you thank you so much thank you jeff there.
<clears throat> Next, we'll hear from Tracy Kajusi Korea, who will be talking about STEER data collection efforts that um, Jeff did brief briefly mentioned. Tracy is the Leo E. and Patty Ruth Lindbeck Collegiate Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Scientists at the University of Notre Dame. Her research focuses on disaster risk reduction and civil infrastructure challenges posed by increased urbanization and vulnerability. Tracy is also serving as the inaugural director of the Structural Engineering Extreme Events Reconnaissance Network. Tracy. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being with us today. I'm going to be um, presenting some of the preliminary work that STEER has conducted in Haiti in various partnerships, including the work with Geohazards International that you just heard of. And my goal here is to give you some of the recommendations that we've seen from that initial analysis of the events impacts and examples of some of the field data that has been collected. So um, our response to this event actually initiated on the day of the quake on the 14th of August in the formation of our virtual assessment structural team. That team began its collection of third party data and the authorship of what's called our preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. Uh, this report was released on September 13th. Uh, you can access it at the DOI shown on this slide that's in Design Safe, or also at the STEER website. Just go to our products page. Um, you'll note on the cover the contributions from individuals around the world to this particular response. And this report um, has a number of recommendations that organized under five primary themes that I'll use to illustrate some of the opportunities to learn from this event. So the first thing we saw in our preliminary analysis of data was the importance of validating the performance of post-2010 and post-2016 construction. There was a lot of emphasis on improving the seismic resistance of schools and other critical infrastructure following the 2010 earthquake. So it's critical to see now how structures built to those enhanced standards or retrofitted post-2010 have performed in this event. We do need to caveat, however, that this is also an exercise in seeing the extent to which these practices had actually reached the Sud, the Grand Anse, and Neep, um, being that they were not the location of the 2010 quake. So it's also reiterating the importance of emphasizing aseismic design practices across the seismically active country. The important work that GHI is doing is critical in that regard. Um, for an example, you can see on the left here, Digicel Foundation was active in constructing schools after 2010, um, adopting more enhanced uh, seismic design principles. And so you can see examples from schools in an area like NEEP in our data set, where we can now see the performance of these in this event. The second consideration here post-2016 is that Grand Anse and Sud were affected significantly by Hurricane Matthew. There was extensive reconstruction after 2016 as a result of that. And our reconnaissance in that event as responders to the 2016 event, we did note a lack of a seismic considerations for those reconstruction efforts. Often buildings were going heavier to counter the wind um, uplift in hurricanes, and that was actually heightening their seismic risk. Unfortunately, our concerns were verified then in this event. In fact, many NGO finance projects did not have appropriate consideration of seismic risk. You can see failures of some of those shown here in examples from Grand Anse. And thus, it's really critical that we spend some time in this event evaluating performance of that post-2010 and post-2016 construction, many of which were engineered or at least using standardized designs, and critical to do that for this multi-hazard context. Our second topic for consideration is really focused on confined masonry. It's the bread and butter um, typology that you'll see in Haiti, but it's implemented in a wide range of um, you know, variations. In low and middle income countries, confined masonry proves to be a very viable system to help people construct, but it's implemented in such a wide ranging variance, it's hard to see how it actually is performing in implementation. One of the challenges in Haiti is that you will see varying levels of confinement actually achieved in practice. So you'll see, quote, confined buildings based on construction sequence that really don't behave as confined because of the many key details that were omitted in the implementation. They actually behave closer to unreinforced masonry due to that weak level of confinement. But then you'll see other buildings along this spectrum where I'm showing snapshots from our field work in Haiti that illustrate different um, confining practices and variable levels of performance, eventually reaching structures that are actually infill frames in terms of the way that they behave and they're constructed. So it's important to kind of look across the spectrum to get a better idea of not just how confined masonry performed in theory, but how the different permutations of confined masonry that we see in practice in places like Haiti and other low and middle income countries actually fared in an event like this. 
The third area of consideration that we wanted to explore was also the performance of some of the vernacular architecture that comprises the more rural populations um, modes of construction. You know, one of the challenges with reinforced concrete and masonry systems is that when not properly um, designed, you see these catastrophic collapses, these pancake collapses that were typified in the 2010 event. We sadly saw them again here in this 2021 event. And those dramatic failures remind us of the importance of evaluating other potential typologies, especially for those who do not have the income level and access to implement concrete and masonry correctly. So as a result, when we start looking at things like Waddle and Dobb construction that you'll see in Haiti, where uh, families are taking uh, what's essentially a wood frame typology and infilling it with combinations of stone and earth and some form of binder, those kind of you know, infilled wood frame systems at times actually showed superior performance with respect to avoiding some of these catastrophic pancake collapses. As you can see in the picture on the left, one that's actually performed very nicely in this event, and one on the right, which is actually undergoing reconstruction. You can see that the 3D form of the system was actually maintained through the earthquake, and now the damaged wall material has been removed, it's being recycled and being prepared for re-implementation. Now there's plenty to be learned about how to do this better and how to guide families in repairing and reconstructing. But what's notable is you actually still have a 3D space to occupy and tarp while you're doing the repair. And that's dramatically different than some of those catastrophic collapses of block construction that we're seeing in the same regions. Thus, it's noteworthy for us to examine in our data set how this type of typology is actually performing, what are some of the contemporary implementations to appropriately laterally brace and sheathe these systems so they perform better, how can we build upon the designs that were proliferated after Hurricane Matthew to actually see now if they're delivering that multi-hazard um, resistance that they actually will need in these locations. Our fourth area of um, recommendation or observation is kind of building on this same idea. That lack of cost and technical capacity necessary to execute block and concrete construction well leads to this kind of adoption of very inferior materials and construction practices. The first two topics, um, topics two and three, you know, really identify opportunities to learn. But what we also think is critical is expanding cost-effective multi-hazard resistant options that are culturally appropriate for places like Haiti and are feasible with the skill sets that you'll find in country. Examples here show how some of that Waddle and Dobb construction has been appropriately um, engineered or uh, semi-engineered and then proliferated by non-governmental organizations, offering examples of how we can build in these traditional and native modes of construction in ways that still are dignified and safe. And it's important in this process then to remove the stigma that's attached to building these more traditional houses so they become a cost-effective and viable option. And the last point that we made in our initial recommendations was there are a lot of critical tools, some of which were discussed in this webinar, that are critical for rapid loss estimation and impact forecasting using satellite imagery and other rapid assessment means after a major earthquake. Those are really hard to execute in places like Haiti where construction practices are highly variable and data is exceptionally sparse. So if we want to be able to improve our predictive capabilities for these kinds of events, we do need ground level observations to be able to enrich things like the pager tool suite that you see from USGS or some of the different satellite based um, assessment products that are used in the non governmental and humanitarian response sectors. And so what we wanted to do in this fifth recommendation get into a data sparse environment and rapidly collect data was to actually equip local um, non-experts with their smartphones to actually start collecting that data immediately after the event, and then finding ways to actually get those records assessed according to an EMS 98 standard using volunteer remote engineers. So here you can see some of the Geohazards International um, volunteers or, or workers assembling for the training and use of this mobile app to begin that data collection. So what started from a STEER virtual assessment team dramatically expanded shortly after the earthquake to include then non-expert field data collectors working in partnership with Geohazards International and then remote expert assessors that were beyond the STEER membership who were gonna start then aiding us in evaluating the data coming in from our non-experts. And with the generous funding of USAID and USGS through Geohazards International, we were able to scale up this effort. Our sampling strategy on the ground in Haiti consisted of this uh, sort of three-tiered approach. 
we wanted an unbiased sample. That means that we conduct an assessment of every third building in an identified region, um, whether or not it has damage. So we can get a representative sample. And those buildings are assessed using our rapid response app. That's the app that was alluded to in the earlier presentation. Then the only exception to that sampling strategy is when the individual surveying sees a priority building. And a priority building is either a NGO standard housing design or a critical facility, then they automatically always take a record in those instances. And if that critical building happens to be what we call a benchmark building, a building that was likely engineered or semi-engineered, they also implement a Creole-based version of the Did You Feel It survey. And so buildings like this would actually receive then the human survey to get us Did You Feel It data. Adopting this approach, we were then able to build into our mobile app a simple process for our data collectors. They geotag the building, take photos of all sides of the building, and then take detailed photos of the damage and record additional audio files to explain the context. That data then comes into our backend portal and we can see their photos loading in. We push that to a translator who listens to the audio and then transcribes it in the same platform. And then it's pushed out to a remote engineer who will complete the virtual assessment and tag the building with a rating. Again, that's on an EMS 98 uh, system. We build guidance to help our assessors classify buildings as the masonry and timber systems common in Haiti, and then map those different typologies to that five point rating system. The guidance gives them step by step examples of how this looks in Haiti and how to score that damage for each of those system types. Our timeline shows here uh, explains how we scaled up from the initial response into data collection in the Sioux department, then eventually in NEEP, and finally now in Grand Anse. Our raw data now is over 10,000 building assessments and almost 2,000 did you feel it as of the beginning of this week, distributed across NEEP, Grand Anse, and the Sud, with heavy concentrations in the major cities in each of these areas. Our breakdown of buildings shows a, a nice representation and sample, including a heavy emphasis on schools spearheaded by our friends at GHI. The bottom link here shows you how to access the data. All of our data and resources are open to you at the STEER website. So you can go in and look at this data and interact with it. And with that, I'd like to thank the US National Science Foundation as well as USAID and USGS for their support of this joint effort between STEER and GHI and all of the individuals who have joined it, including our friends at EFIT who are conducting a virtual mission this week using our data. Most importantly, I'd like to recognize these data collectors. These men and women, some of which lost their homes in this event are out collecting data to help us understand this disaster and reminding us every day of what it means to truly be resilient. So on behalf of them, we thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Tracy. Next, we'll hear from Joanne Paradine, who will discuss the social and political aspects of the earthquake. Joanne is a second year doctoral student in the School of International and Public Affairs at the Florida International University. Her research interest is on the dimensions of equity, stakeholder engagement, and emergency management. Before joining the doctoral program, she worked as a practitioner leading climate justice and international disaster resilience initiatives following emergency events. She holds a Master of Public Health and Environmental Health and a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland in College Park, Maryland. Joanne? Thank you, Maggie. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's event. And it's a pleasure to be sharing this space with you. And as Dr. Dashti mentioned, I'll be going over the social science implications or social political context um, of disasters in Haiti. And what, what I want to bring up is I would like you to uh, use your imagination and think about what your personal experience has been with Haiti, whether that be you having grown up in Haiti, worked in Haiti, learn about Haiti from the media, what has been your perspective or your impression about Haiti. So over the next few slides, what I, what I intend to do is to talk about uh, three areas that the team has explored to contextualize uh, disasters. Um, including like concurrent and consecutive disasters in Haiti. And what does that mean when we're talking about emergency management? So, you know, 
depending on your relationship uh, or your experience with Haiti, uh, you might either have some positive reflection about the country. You could also have some traumatizing or concerning reflection about Haiti. And the, the images or what we're learning about Haiti um, are not new. It's not new information. It's been an ongoing issue, whether it be on the uplifting side or the concerning side. So first, uh, going into the uh, data collection, we've explored different sources, um, and it pretty much has been a combination of news articles and reports, uh, international agencies and Haitian institutions looking at databases, um, and also looking at the news articles that have come out or dashboards. And some of the uh, organizations that we've looked into, uh, I want to believe that most of us are familiar with them. Uh, those include the United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, uh, there's the Haitian Ministry of Public Health. Um, and we also have one um, prominent uh, media outlet uh, in Haiti called the Nouvelles. So this is just uh, a sample of some of the sources that we've utilized to organize uh, our presentation for today. So the first area that I want to address is Haiti being referred to as a fragile or failed state. And you know, looking at this um, from the perspective of challenges that are being faced when it comes to disaster response and recovery. So unfortunately, even though Haiti is known as uh, the first black republic in the Western hemisphere, uh, the, the state of the country, the state of the government, unfortunately, is unable to provide some of the basic services or basic functions um, that, that its uh, population needs. So when we think about education, access to good quality education is not available to most Haitians. Uh, the healthcare system uh, is uh, fragile, access to clean water, uh, is another issue. And uh, most recently, what we're seeing with the uptick of violence, it's becoming clearer that uh, the security and law enforcement system and the justice system is not even able to provide that security that Haitian citizens need. So uh, one, when, when we think about where, how does Haiti compare to other countries around the world, the United Nations Development Program has a human development index that looks at three dimensions. And those dimensions being uh, education, uh, health, and income. Um, and using those dimensions to rank uh, countries in terms of their progress. So out of 189 countries, Haiti ranks 170. And with respects to its neighboring country, which is the Dominican Republic, uh, that country holds uh, the 88th uh, place on that rank. And because of this uh, downward uh, fall of the economic system of, of the country, what we know today is that 78% of the population is living on less than $2 a day. Uh, about 38% of the population does not have access to clean water. Um, and about 25% of the population is illiterate. Now, in addition to uh, some of the economic impact, uh, what we are seeing as a fragile state, the, the country also relies heavily on foreign donors. So when we're looking at uh, countries that provide aid to Haiti uh, under this uh, program called the Official Development Assistance, what we know based on a 2018 report is that uh, of, of the, assist, the assistance that Haiti has received back in uh, that 2018 report represents about 10% of the um, gross national income. And when we compare that to what the Dominican Republic has received, uh, it's less than 1%. We also know that Haiti relies heavily on uh, support from the diaspora. So back in 2019, what we've seen is that the remittances from the diaspora represented about 39% of the uh, GDP of Haiti. And when we compare that to the Dominican Republic, uh, it's only about 8% in that country. So with this reliance on foreign donors, um, 
comes uh, tensions, unfortunately, between those with and those without access to basic services, uh, and also this inequi inequitable uh, uh, distribution of resources to those who uh, need access to those resources. So here we have a simple quote from a community leader who was interviewed in Port-au-Prince after the 2010 earthquake. And unfortunately, uh, they had some negative experiences where their tent was being vandalized just because uh, they had access to that resource and others did not have access to that resource. So that addresses some of the tensions that we're seeing within the community. Um, we are also seeing a disconnect and mistrust between the government and Haitian citizens, uh, distrust and, mis and disconnect between the government and the aid agencies, and also a disconnect and mistrust between the people and the aid agencies. So here is a highlight from another interview that took place with an international aid agency representative in Haiti. And their concerns is that uh, when uh, individuals were uh, moving into uh, temporary camps, uh, they notice at night, uh, some of those individuals would leave uh, the camps, then return the following day with the expectation that by being present on the camp, they'll be able to have access to resources. So I've just covered the first area addressing uh, the fragile state. Now I'll transition into consecutive and concurrent disasters. Um, unfortunately, Haiti has seen a long list of disasters and those disasters being either um, natural hazards or conflict related disasters. And about 96% of the population in Haiti is vulnerable to natural disasters. So that could, those could be storms, um, hurricane, uh, flooding, and disasters in general, uh, not only in Haiti, do have an impact on the economic state uh, of a country. And in Haiti, what we're seeing, for example, with the 2010 earthquake, the estimated damage was at 120% of the GDP. And the 2016 Hurricane Matthew damage was estimated at 32% of the 2015 GDP. And those are only representing single disasters. So I want you to th start thinking about what is the true economic impact when we are uh, putting together not only natural hazards, but also conflict related uh, uh, disasters and when they are happening at the same time. So the next three slides will provide a timeline, but I'm not going to dig into them uh, deep. But the point here is, if we're looking at Haiti from 1986, when the dictatorship was overthrown all the way up to 2021, what we're seeing is pretty much every year there has been major uh, natural hazards um, and also uh, conflict related disasters. So what that means is we could argue there's not really that period for Haiti to even recover from a disaster. So when dealing with concurrent disasters, what, what does that mean, especially when we're looking at it from a lens of a, um, the, the social political context of Haiti? And here, this is a slide that um, Dr. Dashti uh, briefly went over. Um, and what it does, it explores the intersection of different crises in Haiti since the 2010 earthquake. So it looks at uh, population density, population displacement, and the different categories of hazards. And what we're seeing is when there is a disaster, regardless of whether it's a natural hazards or conflict related, there is uh, some level of relationship or association with displacement. And when we talk about displacements, we do have internal displacements and also uh, populations within the country of Haiti, leaving Haiti and heading towards uh, other geographical region outside of the country. So uh, to, to, to wrap up that section of consecutive and concurrent disasters, um, unfortunately, that brings limited emergency management preparedness and coping mechanisms. 
And when we think about chronic uh, trauma and never having that opportunity to recover, what are some of the implications when we talk about mental health, homelessness, food insecurity, and other areas? So I want to wrap up this specific slide with this quote from an international aid agency representative who indicated that we need people who know how to deal with disasters. So talking about the expertise, does that resource, is that resource available in Haiti? If not, how do we make sure that there's a, a, an infrastructure in place to bring that resource in, especially when dealing with natural disasters? We also know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, access to information and understanding the development of the pandemic has been um, of a concern uh, for some. So when the first case of uh, COVID-19 was reported in Haiti last year, what I started doing uh, personally was to track uh, numbers that were being released by the Haitian Ministry of Health. The reason being is because there is not a consistency in place when it comes to information dissemination. And it also can be difficult to actually have access to that information or the way how the information is presented can be challenging to digest or dissect. So what I did uh, since March of 2020, I've been recording uh, uh, the data coming out from the Ministry of Public Health and putting them in a dashboard with the intent of making the information easy to access and also getting a broader overall picture of what's happening across the country based on, of, on the uh, individual reports that are being released by the uh, ministry. And uh, when, when we, so the third area now is looking at the intersectionality with displacement and disasters. So here we're looking at a map from uh, the 2010 earthquake intensity and population displacement. And what we're seeing is that there has been a mass internal displacement uh, in different parts of the country. And here we're looking at the Southern part of the country with some about 200,000 moving up to the North. Um, and when we, call, when we think about uh, Haiti being in a fragile state and not having the infrastructure to provide basic services to its citizens, what does that mean when we are actually witnessing mass displacement uh, within the country? Hi, Joanne, just quickly, if you could um, wrap up in a couple of minutes, sorry. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, and uh, th this slide here is showing like the, the displacements from Haiti to other countries and more recently with the uh, border crisis, Texas, uh, Mexico border crisis, we've seen like a major uptick in uh, Haitians seeking asylum. But one thing that we need to be um, aware of is that the journey did not start yesterday. It didn't start today. It started as far back as the 2010 um, earthquake. But in addition to disasters contributing to displacements, uh, there's also conflict-related disasters that contribute to displacement. And just last weekend, the Washington Post released this article saying that the uh, Haiti has the highest per capita kidnapping rate in the world. So to, to wrap up my presentation, I, I think what, what I want to say, you know, going back to that first uh, statement that I made about your experience with Haiti, uh, personally, for as, as an individual who grew up in Haiti, I always think about the resilience of the Haitians, uh, how they are able to uh, make things work. Unfortunately, when we look at the uh, simultaneous disasters that are happening, uh, we need to ask ourselves, what does that mean with regards to the uh, opportunities that exist for a failed state to recover. Um, so what the team is doing right now, we are working with the IRB to actually go in and interview stakeholders in Haiti and also in the diaspora to deepen our understanding of the relationship between disasters in the, in the social political context uh, of Haiti. So thank you for um, listening to some of my talking points. Back to you, Maggie. 
Thanks, Joanne. And finally, we'll hear from Lindsay Davis, who will talk about the humanitarian response to the earthquake. Lindsay manages the USAID USGS Earthquake Disaster Assistance Team, a bilateral activity that supports scientists from USGS to engage in international capacity building and response related to earthquakes. While she is employed as a physical scientist with the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program, she sits within the organizational structure of both USGS and USAID. In her role, she serves as a liaison between USGS and USAID and as a geoscience advisor for USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. Lindsay. Great, thank you very much. Do my slides look okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Lindsay Davis and um, yeah, as mentioned, I work for the U.S. Agency for International Development's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and the U.S. Geological Survey. And so I serve as a liaison between the two of those bureaus and sit within the organizational structures of both bureaus as well. And um, I also wanted to mention that I served as the technical coordinator for BHA's Haiti 2021 Earthquake Response Management Team, which I'll touch on what that is in a moment for those of you who don't know. So BHA is the lead coordinator of U.S. international disaster assistance, reaching tens of millions of people around the world. And it was created in 2020 by merging the expertise and resources of two different offices, the Office of Food for Peace and the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, also known as OFDA. So having a single voice enables BHA to deliver aid more efficiently and effectively. And the scale and complexity of crises have significantly increased in the past decade. Um, so BHA's approach is to implement a comprehensive methodology um, to human humanitarian responses by providing aid to people in need while also setting the initial foundation for a longer term recovery where appropriate. BHA's mission is to save lives, alleviate human suffering, and reduce the physical, social, and economic impact of humanitarian crises. And they work to provide humanitarian aid, but also to help the world's most vulnerable people prepare, recover, and transition from crisis to self-reliance. This is a snapshot of BHA's disaster responses in fiscal year 2020. And as you can see, complex emergencies are the most frequent type of disaster, but BHA also responds to rapid and slow onset disasters. And experience responding to complex emergencies can be useful for responding to rapid onset events such as the earthquake in Haiti where there are challenges such as those highlighted by Joanne. When it comes to responding to disasters and humanitarian crises, there are several criteria that must be met before BHA can respond, um, such as these listed here. There must be evidence of unmet humanitarian needs. The response must align with BHA's mission. The affected country must be willing to accept support and responding must align with the US government's interest in humanitarian objectives. If those criteria are met, BHA has several response options, including providing an initial $100,000 in immediate assistance to locally purchase and distribute relief supplies, funding partners on the ground through grants to aid agencies, and in that case, USAID staff carefully monitor grantee programs to ensure resources are used wisely and to determine whether projects need to be adapted to changing conditions. They can employ, deploy disaster experts or a disaster assistance response team or DART or stand up a response management team. And I'll touch on those two in just a moment. They can send food and relief supplies from one of the warehouses that they have located globally. And as a lead federal coordinator of the response, they can request support from other US government agencies, um, which may have unique capabilities that are required to support BHA's response. So for example, when scientific products can inform decision-making, BHA can draw on other government agencies to provide that information. And those government agencies are often interfacing with many of the organizations that are on this call, for example, in a geologic response. Um, another option is that there can be no response. There are times when a disaster hits and the country can respond itself and BHA does not need to assist with a response. So I did wanna to touch on what a DART and RMT are. If the size and the scope of a disaster merit it, BHA can deploy either or both of these teams. And a DART is a rapid response team of experts that deploys immediately after a disaster strikes. And their job is to identify humanitarian needs and set response priorities. 
recommend how the US government should respond, coordinate with local officials in the affected country, other donors, other US government agencies, et cetera. Um, for example, the US military. And the DART is flexible and expands and contracts in size based on the current needs of a response. The RMT, a response management team, um, which is the team that I served on as a technical coordinator for the 2021 Haiti response, uh, often mirrors the DART. And so that team also expands and contracts as needed. And the functions of the RMT are to serve as the center of strategy and planning for the response. It's typically based in Washington, DC, although there was a pretty large virtual component for the Haiti earthquake. It's the coordination hub with other federal agencies, and it's the nexus for producing and disseminating public information products. So here's some statistics about the Haiti 2020 earthquake response, 2021 earthquake response. Um, and, and note that this is from September 24th. So these have likely changed some since this document was published. Give you a chance to take a look. And the photos here show the Fairfax Urban Search and Rescue Team assessing a damaged home in the World Food Program di distributing relief supplies. I also wanted to provide a timeline that's been a theme today. Um, and this is intended to show how humanitarian response is implemented by BHA using the Haiti 2021 earthquake as an example. So it starts with the event itself. And in this case, the US ambassador issued a disaster declaration the same day as the earthquake and the DART and USAR teams were deployed the day after. Tropical depression Grace made landfall two days after the earthquake. The urban search and rescue team demobilized on August 25th and the DART transitioned to humanitarian response efforts. Um, on August 26th, Administrator Power announced $32 million in assistance would be provided for the Haiti earthquake. That figure has since increased. And the DART and RMT demobilized on September 30th, 2021, and handed over project oversight to the USAID mission in Haiti. Shelter, logistics, protection, health, water sanitation and hygiene, and food were identified early on as priority sectors for the response effort. There are other sectors as well that are, that are quite important, such as multipurpose cash assistance, nutrition, et cetera. And BHA aligns the response strategy with the priorities of the government of Haiti. And other US government agencies contributed and collaborated closely with BHA, such as the Department of Defense Southcom, which established Joint Task Force Haiti, US Coast Guard, CDC, and others. And there are also, of course, multiple other countries and, and many other organizations contributing to the response. So putting on my USGS, USAID Earthquake Disaster Assistance Team hat for a moment, USGS is one of the agencies that collaborates closely with BHA, as you heard from Sue and Kate, and the Earthquake and Landslide Disaster Assistance Teams draw from USGS to provide relevant expertise for capacity building projects in response uh, related to earthquakes and landslides. Funding for both project and response work is provided by both USAID, BHA, and USGS for these activities. We have two ongoing projects in Haiti, one that Zuli is related to monitoring and one that's a USGS Geohazards International collaboration on family preparedness for natural hazards. And we've been able to draw on the relationships and logistics of these projects from EDAT and LDAT uh, to support the humanitarian response. So Sue and Kate mentioned some of these such as the USGS near real-time products, aftershock informational products and landslide mapping are, are a few other examples. Establishing relationships through collaboration in non-response time, such as through the, the projects I mentioned, allows us to leverage partnerships during responses. So for example, um, Gepta mentioned some of this, but GHI provided information on protective measures related to aftershocks to USGS and USGS aftershock um, forecast folks provided general information on aftershocks that GHI staff in Haiti was able to translate into Creole. And as, as Geffen mentioned, he was able to share aftershock information through local outreach activities, including on the radio in affected areas. And then that in turn, we were able to, as USGS, publish that information on the USGS social media accounts to get it out in both languages, both English and, and Creole. Kate also mentioned the overflight, which was only possible due to pre-established relationships and these were even more important due to the pandemic and security situation, which made it harder for USGS and other scientists to travel to Haiti for the response. 
And as Geppa and Tracy mentioned, USAID allowed repurposing of funds under the USGS GHI Family Preparedness Project to support the expansion of the damage assessment activities that STEER and GHI were engaging in, which have in turn been shared with BHA and the shelter cluster. So I just wanted to show the full circle that some of these products go through to then inform the humanitarian sector as well. So in general, scientific input from USG and others, many of whom have spoken today, contributes to things such as initial decisions about deployment, situational awareness, life safety concerns, prioritization of resources for damage assessment and assistance, informing the logistics of accessing remote and or damaged areas, et cetera. And as you can see, there are many opportunities to leverage scientific relationships and products to support humanitarian response efforts. And as I'm wrapping up, I just wanted to um, show a slide that I borrowed from Gary Mayberry at USAID, who's a senior geoscience advisor as well. And she was showing a comparison of USAID's 2021 versus 2010 responses. And as you can see, in 2010, there was a larger disaster, um, many more deaths than about 386 million in, in terms of damages. And um, since then, USAID, BHA, at the lead, lead coordinating role that BHA plays has become more organized and there's clear, clear more post-disaster information. Um, the USAID, USGS Earthquake Disaster Assistance Team is better organized. And as you know, COVID-19 reduced some of the technical response that occurred, but the humanitarian response was not reduced by this. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, thanks so much to EERI for hosting and to my colleagues on the call for their wonderful presentations and their work and to all the attendees for your time and to the people of Haiti for their resilience. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And thanks again to all of our speakers. Um, they've been busy, <clears throat> sorry, they've been busy uh, answering questions throughout the webinar. We don't have time for additional questions now, uh, but as we end, I just want to, um, mention a few things that a recording of the webinar, um, along with some of the presentation slides, will be available on the LFE website. Professional development hours are available from this webinar, and information will be provided in a follow up email. Uh, the follow up email will also contain a link to a post webinar survey, so we'd really appreciate if you take a few minutes to complete that survey and provide your feedback. And finally, we want to 